like to add a couple of other thank yous. Uh, one is to one of our gold sponsors, AT&T, um, and also to acknowledge uh, Renee Campbell as one of the community sponsors of this dinner. And I want to mention her name one more time, and I'd like to acknowledge, acknowledge the co-chairs of the Center for African Studies and Library Board who are here this evening, Renee Campbell, uh, Judge Cheryl Luke, who is sitting down here in the front. Cheryl. Rita Rothman. Rita. And um, our newest member, Ashe Gassaway. I see you right there. And I'd also like to have us um, give a, a round of appreciation for the drummers whose endurance is unbelievable. I remember as a little girl 
world. Now I'm going to pretend to be a whole lot younger than I am. <laughs> Leaping through every magazine. And I remember pictures of freedom riders and the folks who sat down at the lunch counters. And there were some very, very young people in those pictures. They were college students. Where are graduate students? College students. They were high school students. They were putting their lives on the line. Julia Bond, as a student, was organizing lunch counter protests, organizing human rights organizations in the South, getting arrested. In Ebony Magazine and in Jet were pictures of him in handcuffs. And as someone reminded me in the ladies' room, Connie, don't you remember that picture of him when he had that huge problem? <laughs> it was a great honor to be able to introduce Dr. Bond. And we are very privileged to have him here. It was past 11 o'clock this time. And I just want to say, please welcome, and I'm sure we're going to be in for a real treat this lecture, Dr. Julian Bond.
responsibilities are to complete its unfinished business today. When we look back at that movement from today, we now see a very different view of the events and personalities of the period. Instead of the towering figures of Kings and Kennedy standing alone, we now also see an army of anonymous women and men. Instead of famous speeches made to multitudes, we now also see the planning and the work that preceded the triumph of speech. And instead of a sudden upsurge in black activism in Montgomery in 1955, we now see a long and unceasing history of aggressive challenges to white supremacy that began as long ago as slavery time. And we see a movement which has long followed a plan, first articulated when the 20th century was brand new, a plan that fits our circumstances almost exactly today. In 1905, Dr. Du Bois proposed the following. We must complain, he said, yes, plain, blunt complaint, ceaseless agitation, unfailing exposure of dishonesty and wrong. This is the ancient, unerring way to liberty, and we must follow. Next, he said, we propose to work. These are the things we must try to do. We must press the matter for stopping the curtailment of our political rights. We must urge Negroes to vote honestly and effectively. We must push the matter of civil rights. We must organize business cooperation. We must build schoolhouses and increase the interest in education. We must bring Negroes and labor unions into mutual understanding. We must study Negro history. And we must attack crime among us to do all in our power by word and by deed to increase the efficiency of our race, the enjoyment of its rights, the performance of its duties. Now, Du Bois wrote that plan for the all-black Niagara movement, and it was incorporated into the interracial NAACP, born in 1909. Black Americans have generally followed this prescription for action. The movement then was a kind of second reconstruction, and it won gains at lunch counters, movie theaters, bus stations, polling places, and the fabric of legal segregation began to come undone. Its origins were in a bitter struggle for elemental civil rights, and it has largely become today, in the post-segregation era, a movement for political and economic power. And today, black women and men hold power, uh, hold office and wield power in numbers we dared only dream of before. But despite impressive increases in the number of black people holding public office, despite our ability to sit, eat, ride, vote, go to school in places that used to bar black faces, in some important ways, non-white Americans face problems more difficult to attack now than in all the years that went before. Now much of the origins of today's distresses are found in the recent past and came to climax in the 1980s. Over time, Opposition to government, especially Washington government, succeeded opposition to communism as a secular religion. The United Nations, Washington bureaucrats, gays and lesbians, supporters of minorities and women's rights, all of these replaced the Soviet Union as the evil empire. And together, <laughs> together, they became the energies driving the callous coalition that captured Congress in 1994. But as long ago as 1964, one of the two political parties had begun to remake itself as the White People's Party, and they found a winning formula at the intersection of race and opposition to activist government. Those years then were what these years now threatened to be, a kind of festive party thrown for America's rich. Since 1979, the wages of the bottom 20% of workers have dropped nearly 12%. Workers at the bottom half of the wage scale make 75 cents an hour less today than they did 20 years ago. And for those workers whose skins are black or brown, the gap is greater and their prospects are bleeder. Today, the net financial assets of black families, in which one member has a postgraduate degree, are lower than the assets of white families, in which the highest level of education achieved is graduation from elementary school. In 1968, the Kerner Commission, appointed by President Johnson to investigate the causes and prescribe the cures for the riots of 1967, concluded that racism was the single most important cause, 
of continued inequality between whites and blacks. But within a few very short years, the growing number of blacks, of other minorities, and women pushing for entry into and power in the academy, the media, business, government, other traditionally white male institutions created a backlash in the discourse over race. The previously privileged majority exploded in angry resentment at having to share space with the formerly excluded. Opinion leaders began to redefine and reformulate the very terms of the discussion. No longer was the Kerner Commission's description of the problem accepted. Any indictment of majority America could be abandoned, and instead, a Susan Smith defense was adopted. Black people did it. Did it to the country, did it to themselves. Black behavior, not white racism, became the reason why whites and blacks lived in separate worlds. Racism retreated and pathology advanced. The burden of racial problem solving shifted from its creators to its victims. The failure of the lesser breeds to enjoy society's fruits became their fault alone. In a kind of nonsensical tautology, we heard again and again, oh, those people are poor because they're pathological. They're pathological because they are poor. So pressure for additional civil rights laws suddenly became special plea. America's most privileged population, white men, suddenly became a victim class. Aggressive blacks and pushy women were responsible for America's demise. All this occurred despite almost daily incidents of racial attack and a series of public opinion polls that demonstrate too many Americans think racial minorities are less than equal human beings, lacking in thrift, morality, industriousness, and patriotism. Most just don't think minorities are suspect. They think there are more of them than there actually are. <laughs> According to a Gallup poll, the average American thinks that 18% of all Americans are Jewish. The real figure is 3%. <laughs> the average American thinks that 21% of all Americans are Hispanic. The real figure is 8%. Most Americans think that 32% of all Americans are black. The real figure is 12%. For the average American, then, minorities are the majority. 71% of the national population. <laughs> this exaggeration of the other, this blame shifting and role reversal, where the victim becomes the perpetrator, where the minority becomes the majority, this perversion of reality occurred as a result of an organized campaign which continues until this day. It is led by a curious mix of whites and blacks, academics, journalists, and policymakers. They profess strong support for equal rights while they oppose every tool designed to achieve that goal. For these new races, equal opportunity is a burden society can't afford to bear. Their message is that including blacks and women excludes quality. Now, the successful strategies of the movement of the 1960s were litigation, organization, mobilization, and coalition all aimed at creating a national political constituency for civil rights advances. In the 1970s, however, electoral strategies alone began to dominate. No sooner had black workers begun to win access to industrial jobs and organized labor, the jobs went offshore, and labor declined in power and influence. Then black elites joined white elites at the feeding trough. Since the heady days of the 1960s, too many have concentrated too much on enriching too few while the large numbers of working class black Americans, like their counterparts in the larger society, have seen their plight ignored, their income shrink, and their jobs disappear. Dr. King lost his life supporting a garbage worker strike in Memphis. The right to decent work at decent pay is as basic to human freedom as the right to vote. Negroes, King said in 1961, are almost entirely a working people. There are pitifully few Negro millionaires and few Negro employers. That there are many more black millionaires today is a tribute to the movement King led. That in these best of times, unemployment rates for blacks are twice those for whites. That's an indictment of our times, a reflection of our failure to keep the movement coming on. Everywhere black Americans face conditions very different from, but just as daunting as the bus back seats, 
the fire hoses, the billy clubs of three decades ago. When I was young, bad boys fought with knives, not with automatic weapons. Crack was something that if you stepped on it, you'd break your mother's back. <laughs> were about June and moon, not ugly words for women. But on the streets and sidewalks where too many black Americans live, crime and violence are a frequent rule. As angry white men blow up buildings, angry black men blow each other away. In America today, compared with a white child, a black child is one and a half times more likely to grow up in a family whose head did not finish high school, two times as likely to be born to a teenage mother, Two and a half times more likely to be born at low birth weight, three times more likely to live in a single parent home, four times more likely to have a mother who had no prenatal care, four and a half times more likely to live with neither parent, five times as likely to depend solely on a mother's earnings, and nine times as likely to be a victim of homicide as a teenager or a young adult. The end of a long, winding uphill struggle to beat the racial odds against success. Nobody beat Rodney King because he was poor. Affirmative action created the sizable middle class that constitutes one third of all black Americans today. In the late 1960s, the wages of black women in the textile industry tripled. From 70 to 90, the number of black police officers doubled. Black electricians tripled. Black bank tellers quadrupled. The percentage in managerial and technical jobs doubled. The number of college students tripled. These aren't just numbers. They represent the growth and the spread of the tiny middle class I knew as a boy into a stable one-third of all black Americans today. Women and men with jobs and homes able to provide for their families now and in the future. Outside this building, there's a parking lot. Some of the spaces in the lot are reserved for handicapped drivers. An able-bodied driver comes into the lot and sees those spaces, thinks he's been denied the right to park. But taking those spaces away increases room for the able-bodied by only a handful, but it makes all the difference in the world to the handicapped. Taking those spaces away deprives us of the company of a man or a woman of a student who might enrich our lives. Without affirmative action, both white collars and blue collars around black necks would begin to shrink, with a huge depressive effect on income, employment, home ownership, and education. That's because racism is alive and all too well in America. Those who would have us believe otherwise, who argue for a return to a fantasy colorblind America that never was, who would have us believe that their opposition is rooted in a desire for fairness and equality, these people are engaged in justification, rationalization, and downright prevarication. We've long heard these arguments from white racists. They're joined today by black self-haters and apologists too. They are colorblind, all right. They're blind to the consequences of being the wrong color in America. <laughs> Even affirmative action's poster child. Justice Myers Thomas. <laughs> Justice Thomas may be right, because ever since he got his most recent affirmative action job, he's been in a foul and nasty mood. It was a dream in 1963, it's a dream today. In 1967, he said this, a society that has done something special against the Negro for hundreds of years must now do something special for him. But we look back on these King years with some nostalgia, as if these were the only years we were truly able to overcome. Our inability to do so today is caused in small part by the way we recall Dr. King. For most of us, he's little more than an image seen in grainy black and white television film, pictures taken in Washington 35 years ago, the gifted preacher who had a dream. But King, of course, was much more than that, much more than Martin Luther King. He's not the only soldier missing from the freedom fight. That's right. You know, he didn't march from Selma to Montgomery by himself. Right. He didn't speak to an empty field at the March on Washington. There were thousands marching with him and before him, 
and thousands more who did the dirty work that preceded the triumph of march. Black Americans didn't march to freedom. We worked our way to civil rights through the difficult business of organizing. We registered voters one by one. We financed social justice dollar by dollar. We created an interracial coalition nationwide. That movement succeeded because the victims became their own best champions. When Rosa Parks refused to stand up, when Martin King stood up to preach, mass participation came to the movement for civil rights. There's great opportunity for service and action available to each of us, wherever and whomever we happen to be. But for too many people today, the fight for equal justice has become a spectator sport, a kind of national basketball association in which the players are black and the spectators are white. But in this true-to-life competition between good and evil, the players are of every color and condition. The fate of the fans tied to the points scored on the floor. When good prevails, the spectators win too. Because now the ancient forces of evil threaten America again. They're determined to create an anorexic America, too starved and weak to protect the hungry, the forgotten, and the poor. The current civil rights scene <coughs> may seem dismal, but it's not without hope. The nation's oldest civil rights organization is tan, tall, tested, and ready. <laughs> ready for the challenges that lie ahead. At the NAACP, we don't envision much that is new. Our enemy is as old as America itself. The techniques and the tools we've always used to successfully fight white supremacy, organization, mobilization, litigation, those remain the basic tools of our movement today. But we do intend to do the whole things better. We may use the internet and the fax machine, where once the mimeograph machine and the U.S. mail were sufficient. But at bottom, our charge is the same, to fight discrimination wherever it raises its head, in the halls of government, in corporate suites, or in the streets. The pessimist from his corner looks out on the world of wickedness and sin, and blinded by all that is good or hopeful in the condition and the progress of the human race, bewails the present state of affairs predicts woeful things for the future. In every cloud he beholds a destructive storm. In every flash of lightning an omen of evil. In every shadow that falls across his path a lurking foe. But he forgets that the clouds also bring life and hope. That the lightning purifies the atmosphere. That shadow and darkness prepare for sunshine and growth. That hardships and adversity nerve the race as the individual for greater efforts and grander victories. Greater efforts and grander victories. That was the promise his generation made 107 years ago. That was the promise made by the generation that won the great world war for democracy five decades ago. That was the promise made by the generation that brought democracy to America's darkest corners three decades ago. And that is the promise we must all seek to honor today. Thank you.
you. Uh, the UCLA Center for African American Studies proudly presents this award to Julian Bond for his leadership and commitment to the civil rights struggle in America and for delivering the keynote address for the 10th Annual Thurgood Marshall Lecture on Law and Human Rights, March 18, 1999. Again, for your example, your leadership, and your inspiration. Thank you. Thank you.